Hey everybody, good evening. This is Jacqueline Lukeman. And I'm Abdul Shahi Lukeman. And tonight is Sunday, March 25th, and we are coming to you from Washington, D.C. And this is live on current events, coffee, current events, and politics in Lukeman Nation. Yes. It's actually um, uh, uh, March 25th, 2089. We're coming to you from the future. <laughs> And uh, we, we've we been really, really busy, you guys, personal stuff, political stuff, uh, church commitments, all kinds of stuff going on. Yep. So we have not been able to do our midweek show like we have been wanting to, but we were not going to let tonight's show go by, even though neither one of us are feeling great right now. But um, <laughs> we we have to talk about some serious, serious issues. And we have to finish a conversation that we have been having about the Kerner Commission over the past three, uh, no, few weeks. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, and uh, so we've got to finish that conversation. Mm. Obviously, we got to talk about the March for Our Lives that happened uh, yesterday and some connected issues uh, and some other things. But in the meantime, we're going to give you guys a chance to share this video Invite mm -hmm. your friends. Uh, let me go over here to YouTube because I always try to make sure that, uh, see, there's always somebody over in YouTube. <laughs> hey, Lisa, how you doing? Glad that All you right. are in tonight and on the discussion tonight from the beginning too. Um, so listen, we, uh, we really do appreciate you guys' support and we understand that, you know, for, <laughs> for activists, all right, so you said I should do this. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I've been really, really frustrated the past few weeks because of a, a whole bunch of reasons, but, but least of which has certainly not been um, that I see, and I, and I know we went through this before, but I see a lot of folks out there in social media land who... Um, are not anywhere near as politically savvy as we are. And I'm not even saying we are the epitome of political savviness, but damn it to hell, man, we are smarter than people who, who push their single issue issues and their entire platform is on, you know, DNC corruption or just these people deal in, peddling to people what people want to hear one trick ponies one trick ponies they don't know how to string history and policy and politics together and explain how it affects you and me today they don't know how and i have hesitated saying that particular thing because i've been watching these people for like two three years mm -hmm. So, and I've been seeing them do the same thing, talk about the same thing. Now you're going to see more and more people uh, online again now that Bernie Sanders is running again. And, and, and the only reason they're coming back into, into uh, the online space is because now they can talk about Bernie Sanders again because Bernie Sanders is the only thing they ever knew about politics. And I understand that everybody comes to their awareness when they come to their awareness. But it bothers me when I see people, not just us, but people who we know who are incredibly politically astute. And talented. And incredibly talented and out here doing the work. And they are struggling financially. But these lightweight, one-trick ponies snake don't oil know salesman. jack about them. politics or social issues. Yeah. Snake oil salesmen, exactly what you said, are out here feeding people these dumbass conspiracy theories that actually do not represent what is really going on. But then they always say, well, this is why you don't listen to these other people because they don't represent, they're not telling you what's really going on. But what's really going on is the same thing that's been going on for 50 years that a lot of black people and native people have been trying to tell you has been going on. And all these so-called progressives, all these good progressive folks are throwing bucket loads of money at those people. And people like ourselves and people we know are struggling to get by. I, I mean, look, I'm not saying that anybody owes us their money because you don't. But here's what I know is true. People put their money 
in what they believe has value. And it bothers me that all these people who who have come into this political discussion because of Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. don't value actual political knowledge. They don't value actual historical knowledge. They value people who can um, confirm their weird conspiracy biases. I mean, I swear, it's like these people learn a new word. Mm-hmm. They learn that the deep state might possibly be a thing, and then everything is a deep state deep, deep state conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Every damn thing is a deep state conspiracy to these people. And when you point out to them the fallacy in their logic, especially from the perspective of a lot of these so-called conspiracy theories are coming from the far right. And these people who call themselves progressives are, are signing on, they're co-signing this far right bullshit. And then they're saying that people who don't believe that everything is a conspiracy theory and everything is a false flag and everybody are crisis actors, then all of the, the rest of us who recognize that these things come from actual problems in society that are caused by politics that y'all Bama's, some of y'all friends don't want to know anything about but but then the rest of us are agents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're we're agents and and you know, we we're, we're fucking idiots and we don't know what we're talking about, but we've been living this. And we can't get any support from folks in the especially in this so-called progressive arena, but these crazy ass cabin living Calling everybody racist because they wouldn't let them live stream. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 petty for a reason. I'm petty for a reason because see this kind of crap is why black activists have to work so damn hard. Because we've got to fight the system of white supremacy on one hand. And then on the other hand, we've got to fight white people who are supposed to be fighting for the same things that we do, but who never want to support us in our causes. And then we have to turn around and fight some black people too, mm -hmm. who, who, who co-sign on to the, all we need to do is, is start our own business or all we need to do is save money or all we need to do is invest. And we don't need to hold the system accountable because all that's doing is waiting for the white man to, we got to fight all that and some other stuff. And in all that fighting, people like us get very little support. And sometimes it is just maddening. Sometimes I really just sit on that chaise over there behind me and, and, and look at this desk and I look at this camera and I sit there and say, fuck it, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing it anymore because these people don't care. I'm not saying what they want me to say. They're not interested in the truth. So fine, let them continue to go and be miseducated by their favorite online online talking heads. But then this this dude right here does exactly what he's doing right now. <laughs> Drinks his coffee and then he, you know, brings me back off the ledge. But I'm this this is doing what we do, being so um politically, I don't know, aware. We realize what's going on. We followed politics. We were just watching a documentary earlier. Mm -hmm. I think it's Oliver Stone's The Untold History of the United States. Right. And we're sitting there remembering how we remembered watching these news clips about Star Wars and, and Reagan and, and Basically uh, Brezhnev. Showing, showing our age. Yeah, when we were in high school yeah. and we realized how long, for both of us, and we didn't grow up near each other, he grew up in Camden, New Jersey. I grew up mostly right here in Southeast DC. Didn't know each other until five years ago, five, six years ago. We had a very similar youth growing up. We were both drawn to politics and, 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 and current events. And weren't very popular because of And either. weren't popular. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that, that I am more popular now than I ever was in school. And, I, and I'm still pissed off because I see these people who do nothing but pander to popularity and they get all this. But anyway, I, I just felt like I had to vent because, you know, it's, it, it is frustrating when you know your stuff 
you know that you, that there is more substance to you than what you see other people out there pandering and you see more people, um, clamoring for the fluff than for the substance. And you see it not just with you, but with other people who you draw inspiration and strength from. So, so what you got to add? Well, I mean, I'm not going to belabor the point. All I know is, is that it just confirms to me what I've always known that black subject matter and black topics just aren't important. There's a reason why so many people who go into this kind of um, field that we're in and they start out with wanting to do good. They start out with wanting to highlight the um, problems of the black community. They come in wanting to empower the black community. And a lot of, of sincere people that I know throughout my time being involved when I was in North New Jersey mm -hmm. and I was involved in politics up there. And I see a lot of reason why a lot of people sell out. I see a reason why a lot of people sell their souls and they start off like, hey, look, I want to empower the community. I want, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, um, we can do things to um, politically empower our folks and, and highlight some of the issues in our community and stuff. But then after a while, man, they got to eat. So, you know, so, so what happens is then money comes along and say, OK, that's fine and good. But if you want this money. Then you got to talk about this and you got to talk about that. And they don't want to do it, mm -hmm. but then they got to go that way and do it. And then so what happens is the community get left behind. I've been doing this for years and I understand that these topics, especially dealing with the black community. And that's the reason why we talked about yesterday, even on my show on Pitbulls and Politics. And we'll allude a little bit to it today. That's the reason why this whole March for Our Lives and all this stuff. It just confirms for me what I've always known in the 52 years I've been on this planet and in the 20 something years that I've been doing this activism work is that people, especially progressives, they talk a good game. They talk all this stuff about equality and they talk about all this stuff. But for real, for real, there's still an aversion to wanting to deal with black specific issues. Yep. It's too hard for one thing. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It's uncomfortable. Mm. And we're dealing with a lot of ugly history. So a lot of folks don't want to deal with that. It's easy to be, you know, it's easy to be a former comedian like Tim Black. And get up there and use his comedic skills and get up there and talk about um, uh, uh, the deep state. And it's easy for the Deb Debbie Lassanes and all of them to get on there and talk about this and talk about that. And, you know, because that doesn't require work. Right. That doesn't right. require getting out of your comfort zone. And see, and the thing of it is, when you deal with the people who have been oppressed for so long and who continue to be oppressed, those things are uncomfortable. So we rather... It's like, it's like we would rather turn on Knott's Landing mm -hmm. so I can escape. Mm -hmm. That's what these people are. They like right. Knott's Landing. Right. Mm -hmm. They like other, you know, and, and that's not to disparage them. But what I'm saying is what we do is hard. Nobody yes. likes nothing hard. No. And the thing of it is, is that I can understand that I've seen a lot of good people who got into this work with the intentions of doing what we do, highlight the voices that, that aren't heard mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and to give voice to those voices that aren't heard that lot, a lot. But then again, they get to that point where they get frustrated and they like, wow, you know, so I got a little bit more tougher skin, he does. which is the reason why that I can encourage her because I've been in this longer than her. <laughs> you know, a lot of y'all don't think I have. <laughs> You know, I know it's Jackie, 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 but I've been in this thing a lot longer than her. He has. And so what happens is I develop a, a lot tougher skin. And I know that in spite, now we got some very good allies out there, but there are a lot of you who don't want to deal with this type of subject matter. And, and it, it's, it's okay. It's understandable. Um, this, is, this isn't for everybody. Yeah. But the thing of it is, I watched <laughs> this one, I watched this one dude who don't talk about nothing. Um, <laughs> was able to get funded for a trip to Chicago. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I watched this cat. I watched what he does on his video. He don't talk about nothing um, um, uh, worthwhile. He makes you laugh. He does all this other kind. And now they got this other guy, Anomaly. He, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he, uh, you know, I don't know how long he's been around. I caught some wind of him. And the reason why I caught some wind of him, because he released a video that says, and, and as y'all see, I name people. I don't care. Uh, uh, this cat... Released a video talking about black people need to pull themselves out of their bootstrap. Well, I mean, <laughs> he must have he must have touched a chord with some of these white progressives because <laughs> all of a sudden his profile went up through the roof. So see, I see this and I see that a lot of people out there are full of shit. Mm 
Mm. They're mm. full of shit. They talk this progressive stuff on one hand, and on the other hand, they supporting benign races like this dude Anomaly. Yep. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. So, so I try to encourage um, you, Jackie, and my wife, yeah, he does. and others who are in this field that this this is the life we chosen. We are gonna do this work regardless. You know what I mean? Um, we may not do it as as often as we would like, but we are gonna do this work regardless because when we first started this platform. I, I told her, I said, look, there's going to be some disappointments because people don't want to hear what, about black stuff. They don't. Mm, yeah. long as, they, as long as you're talking about chemtrails, as long as you're talking about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, as long as you're telling people what and what not to eat mm -hmm. and all this other kind, all of the, um, as I call, the, um, the approved of liberal messages. When you speak of all, you know, George Soros and all this, uh, when, you know, uh, the Illuminati, all of this other kind of stuff. When you start speaking of the sanctioned liberal talking points, mm -hmm. oh my God, you good. But once you get off the reservation <laughs> and you start talking about black folks not having no money in 30 years, mm -hmm. you start talking about black folks have, um, um, needing reparations, you start talking about that we can't, that um, it doesn't matter whether Bernie runs, Elizabeth Warren runs. None of these politics, it doesn't matter if they don't support a black Pacific agenda. When you start talking those type of things, then that's when you realize who your friends are. Exactly. Ex I mean, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a really difficult and, and incredibly disappointing past couple of years. But the thing that lets me know that, that it doesn't really, it really doesn't matter what, what y'all progressives do. It doesn't because See, nothing is going to change for us. I mean, black people. Nothing's going to change for us because I know already that that whoever progressives get behind in the next election, y'all aren't going to push that person to focus on the issues that black people face. That's going to have to be our job still, still. And you know how I know this? You know how I know this is true? From two things. From Bernie Sanders' recent uh, inequality town hall. Oh, yeah. And from yesterday's March for Our Lives. Now, Bernie Sanders' inequality town hall was very telling about where progressives still have a problem with black people talking about black issues. Mm -hmm. Because Bernie had uh, Derek Hamilton, who is uh, an economist. Uh, he's black. And he is uh, the... Um, head he he is the head of the uh, econ economics department at the new school in New York City and we're going to try to get him on this show um, but he made it very clear in that economics town hall and I'm going to we're yes we're going to give you the the clip to that video that for progressives in order to talk about combating income inequality or inequality in general in this country, you can't do it without talking about race. It is impossible because the inequality that white people experience yeah. in this country, and, and it exists for white people too, it is 10 times worse for black people. So you can't prescribe a solution for white people using the metrics of white people and believe that that's going to address the problems that are much, much worse for black people. That's, those solutions are similar, but they're not entirely the mm. same. But progressives want to keep the solutions at the same without recognizing that the problems are vastly different in scope. And if you don't believe that the focus of most white people in this country really is not on black folks. It really is on how white people feel about things and whether white people are affected by things or not. Then I would like for you to take a look at this video. Roll that bean footage. <laughs> Roll that beautiful bean footage. Come on up video. There you are. on video oh my computer is being so slow right now <laughs> there it is
Is there no audio? No audio. Well, crap, the audio won't play on the video for some odd reason. So I'm going to have to download that and send that to you. But here's the crux of the issue. And we talked about this a little bit last night on uh, Pitbulls and Politics on your uh, podcast on Spreaker. Yes. Join <laughs> us on that, too. Yes. I Saturday, Saturday nights at 9 p.m. only on Spreaker. Uh, Pitbull and Politics, where we... Uh, we, we get really, really raw on that broadcast. So um, here's the issue with the March for Our Lives. And I said this last night, and I will say this again. It, it My criticism is not for the kids. It really is not. My criticism is for the response of white America and, and a whole lot of black America too. Yep. And a whole lot of black America in responding to the white kids, the mostly white kids from Parkland organizing to march for their lives versus the way they responded to mostly black kids from Ferguson, from Baltimore, from Chicago, now from Sacramento. Because the, 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 uh, the, the march... Uh, the protest in Sacramento over the killing of uh, Clark. uh, Stephon Clark, Clark happened yesterday too, at the same time. So, so you've got a nation, all, all this praise is heaped upon these brave and courageous kids from Parkland, but our kids... Actually, the, the hype was uh, uh, because, see... One of the things that we said yesterday on Pitbull and Politics that we're going to uh, re-emphasize re is that we don't have any criticism for the children. Right. You know, again, because I'm going to tell you something. The white students of Parkland gained my respect, and especially, what's his name, David Hogg? David Hogg. David Hogg, I mean, if he was running for office, I would probably vote for him <laughs> because I love the way that he, he's been exposed in the hypocrisies of media and how he even said that our school is 25% black mm -hmm. yet not any not, no media outlet has given a voice to the black survivors yep. of the Parkland shooting. Yep. So I love the way that he exposes their hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any problem with with them. No, it, it, again, it, it's not the kids. Our and this is what the pastor in the video was saying, the criticism is toward the adults. Right. The criticism is toward these grown ass people who somehow, I said I was going to try to get through, I say this every time, I'm going to try to get through this show without cussing, and I never do. So, but these grown people who cannot seem to hear the same thing when they hear black kids crying out for justice against militarized overarmed police who are shooting down unarmed black people in the streets somehow white america doesn't hear pain and victimization and abuse and doesn't see the tyranny of government against an oppressed people when black kids when our kids are in the streets marching for our lives but when white kids do it oh we need to get behind them oh my god they're so courageous oh we need to support them yes there needs to be change and so you had hundreds of thousands of people in Washington, D.C. yesterday in support of March for Our Lives, but not in support of Baltimore, not in support of the kids in Ferguson, not in support of the kids in Chicago and Sacramento and everywhere else that our kids have been marching for our lives for years, decades even. You even had people who call themselves liberal or progressives talking about, I've never seen anything like this. No, there's never been a student led movement like this. Who the heck did you think led the civil rights movement? You remember the news reels of, of, of the, the police dogs attacking people and, and the fire department hosing people down. You know who those people were? Kids. 
children, children led the civil rights movement, young people, teenagers, college students, the same thing with the Vietnam war. But I mean, these people, these people kill me talking about how th these kids and, and the president Obama did the same thing. He tweeted, you know, oh, these are the brave kids who we were of waiting Parkland. For. These are the kids who we waited. We were uh, uh, who we were waiting for, and you know, nothing can stand in your way to making change. But when black kids went to the White House to try to get him to pass legislation, not convene a task force, but to pass some laws to address unfair policing and abuse of policing that predominantly affects black people, what did he tell them? Well, you can't just keep screaming at people, especially when you have a seat at the table. What's a seat at the table going to do when there are no laws that come out of being at that table and my life don't change? Well, black kids have learned, and we, we were black children at one time, black kids learn early in America that um, they, they're not worth as much right. as other children. Um, mainly white children, black, mm -hmm. black children get that message quite early. And it reminds me of an incident. I remember years ago when I, I was at a bank and I've told you this story, but I was at mm -hmm. a bank and I observe all the time. And I mean, and, um, I remember it was a, it was two, two children, one white, one black, both boys mm -hmm. around about the same age, maybe three or four years old. And we're all sitting in the bank and standing in line in the bank. And the white boy, the little young white child was running around. And, and I looked at the people's faces. It was a couple of black folks there, kind of, you know. And everybody's looking at the white child mm -hmm. with, these, with, these, with this smile. Oh, he's an adorable but, little yeah, child. Yeah, right. With the smile and, mm -hmm. and the look of, 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 of approval mm -hmm. for his existence. Mm -hmm. That he was allowed to run around and be a kid. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the young black boy, who's around about the same age, you know, children are children. So he sees the young white boy running around, so he wants to play with him. Mm -hmm. and, a, and the young white child didn't mind, they're kids. Right. So the young black child runs over there, and they start to play and stuff. And I'm sitting here observing all of this. And the, the woman who, I don't know if it was his mother or his grandmother, the black child, mm -hmm. she immediately scolded him. And she told him to come here, and he came over there. And the other black people in the line just looked at that young black child with such disapproval mm, in their mm -hmm. faces. And I remember at the time that I, when I, when I noticed that and observed that, and I remember at the time I said, wow, I said the message that that young black child is getting right now from, from his environment. Yep. Now it was okay for the young white boy to run around and be a kid and everybody smiling and looking at him all lovingly and stuff. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the black child does it, then he receives the message that he's somehow doing something wrong. Right. So socialization in this country, um, black children get it quite early mm -hmm. that their, that their existence um, is not as valuable. Their lives are not as valuable and that their aspirations um, are not taken as seriously as white children. So when our kids started with, with, with getting involved with, um, with gun control, mm -hmm. So much conditions was placed on them, unlike that was placed on the Parkland kids. Mm -hmm. There was so much conditions placed on them. It was all of this stuff about, well, if you guys did it this way, or, um, or, or you're, going, you're going to lose support for your cause. Right. When right. you have the amount of victims of gun violence um, that, 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 that we suffer in our community, mm -hmm. then how in the hell is you going to tell me that I'm going to lose support for my cause? Right. You know, right. I mean, I mean, I mean, listen to that. When on any given weekend, right? Any given now, you and I grew up during the height of the of the crack murder eras. Mm -hmm. I lived in Camden, you was in I DC. Lived in Southeast DC. And right. Camden and Washington, DC, for y'all for those of you who don't know, back in the nineties, were always running neck and neck <laughs> for who had the most murders. That's it was true. always Camden. And Washington, D.C. was always either one, number one or number two or number two or number one. But they was always in the top five. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about during the time when it was not uncommon to have 500 murders a year yeah. in both cities. Yeah. So, so when we suffer that type of gun violence and that type of violence, how in the hell are you going to tell me that I'm going to lose support for my cause 
you know, me get, you know, me, you know, my community suffering that type of trauma. Right. Isn't right. good enough for you to support me. Exactly. But I have to adhere to some bullshit, uh, uh, um, um, respectability uh, stuff that, 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 uh, unless, unless I act this way, then I can't get no support. But then all it takes is for some white children, like I said, I'm not blaming them. I'm saying the hypocrisy. Right. So right. so when the Parkland kids and then the kids before them up in Sandy Hook, when they started um, uh, um, making themselves known, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, they got to make their voice heard. They didn't have the same conditions. Exactly. You know, they exactly. did not have the same conditions. It was the same way. And a lot of this can't be blamed on white people, Jackie. True. I'm going to tell, tell you why a lot of this can't be blamed on white people. I remember during the Ferguson, uh, I mean, not Ferguson, during um, the Baltimore uprising. Mm -hmm. And that young man, and they all, oh, the media made a big deal out of this. And the young man went out there and he wanted to confront the police. Yep. And his mother beat that boy on camera. On camera. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what kills me with the media. And, and this, this is going to be my point. The View, all of them had that. Now, first of all, the boy was emasculated. On camera, as a young man, in he was, front of the nation, and he was emasculated on T on, when he went to the View. Yes, he because was because the, the mother paraded him around, and everything was like, "Oh yeah, uh, you you um, you got that lesson, didn't you? That's right, you wasn't supposed to." And I'm sitting here thinking, like, okay, first of all, the boy got emasculated. You can see the shame in his face when he went on the View and Whoopi Goldberg and all them making fun of him for this, mm -hmm. and the mother sitting up there all puffed up and proud. And everything that she didn't whip this whip this boy on on, on camera and everything mm -hmm. like that, but what I thought um, the venues like to the viewing them for, they never questioned why the boy was angry in the first place. Right. They never questioned none of the stuff surrounding all that. The thing was, we got to control this young man. We got and, and the thing of it is, is that um, black parents and it was something that we wanted to say too about. How we ourselves, as black parents a lot of times, and black care and, and, and caretakers of black children, how we set them up for failure because not only do we not educate them politically, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we don't even support them when they want, when they, when they do have aspirations to change stuff, we don't even want to support them. That was a key thing with what with this young man from Baltimore when he went on the view because he actually did say they didn't I think one of them did ask him well why did you want to go out there and be a part of the protest and he said because I have seen my my friends killed that's what by the police that's what he said this child said this and and of course then people were like oh that's ridiculous no high school kid has seen their friends killed by the police we just had a trial in baltimore one of the biggest police corruption trials in the history of police corruption trials where the cops were found to have planted to have carried around fake guns toy guns to plant on people just in case they need an excuse to say why they shot somebody to death right right so this child said, I have seen my friends shot and killed by the police, and I was tired of being abused by them. And all of that was glossed over by all those women on The View, even the black one, mm -hmm. and his mother. And they applauded his mother for completely dismissing the, the, the environment that her child was in, that she that her child was being abused by the state and her child wasn't having any more having it anymore. Now we argued then that if it was our kid, our families would have had to have been bailing us both out of jail. Cause we would we would have been out there with him, giving him pointers. Okay now, uh this is what you do. You stand here, you do this, you don't do that. But no, we'll stand, we'll stand, you want to be out here? We'll stand here with you. That's our job as parents, but too often as black parents. But too often, we don't support our kids the way that I have seen these parents for these of, of these Parkland students have been supporting their kids. You know, that CNN interviewed a whole rack of parents of these kids out there. I didn't see, and I'm not saying that, that there were no black parents out there doing it during any of the protests. I know there were, 
but I see the way we respond when our children realize there's something wrong with the system and they don't want to take it anymore. Instead of empowering our kids to fight the system, to you know, say to our kids, yes, the system is unfair. Mm-hmm. It was unfair to us. It was unfair to your grandmama. It was unfair to, a, to, to your great grandmama. We still got to fight. This is where we are. This is our history. And this is what we do. This is how, this is how you do it. Instead of doing that, we're terrified. And, and I understand that part of that is fear. I, I completely get that. But part of it is also, some of us believe that because we're, it's not as bad as it used to be, we can sort of negotiate with white supremacy still. Well, well that, and, and, that, and, and that, that comes up to another debate. Is it really? Is it really not as bad as it used to be? Well, all the data shows that it's worse. That, that you know what is I mean? so, perfect. Yeah, so all yep. the data shows that it's worse. You know, it's just oppression on another. Like we said, it's just oppression with a smile now. Exactly. Well, see, this is the thing um, that that also Jackie to um, under uh, you know to uh, add on to your point. One of the things is that going back to that young man, and this is the thing that how white victimization of black people and black men in particular, how that has a tendency to have a blowback in our community. Mm. That young man already learned that he is not, that that he, he was already emasculated. Right. Right? Right. And he's emasculated by who? His mother, black His female. His mother, yeah. He's going to grow up already if he doesn't overcome that. He's going to grow up and, and, and believe that he doesn't have any power against the oppression of the state. Mm-hmm. That's going to render him weak on some level. Mm. Now, I'm going to show you how the socialization happens. Now, what happens is he's going to be raised as a black man that he has to conform within the system. Mm-hmm. David Hogg, on the other hand, he is already given uh, um, congratulatory and, 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 and approval that he knows that it's up to him to change the system. Mm-hmm. You see the way that both are being socialized. Right. Nobody's exactly. saying that in David Hogg's way. Thank you. Nobody's standing Thank in his you. way talking about he has to conform. In fact, he's given approval that yes, you um, um you're on the right track. You change system. <laughs> the young man in Baltimore was already given the message, just like the message that the young kid when I was in the bank 25 years ago received the message that I am not as important as that little white boy because all of you adults around me are letting me know by the by the looks on your faces mm-hmm. that I am not as important as that little white boy even though he is doing nothing more or nothing less than what I'm doing. Exactly. I have already seen that he is more validated by his but than than I am. Right. The same thing is happening with the kid in Baltimore versus um David Hogg and what happens is is that here we got young black girls who going to grow up to be black women who look at that young man from Baltimore and then say that he is not a man. Right. Because he's right. not a man because he has already been stunted. So he is not a man. So I can't look up to him as a man. I can't look up because why look, what happened with last year? Why don't black men protect us? Why don't this? Why don't, so all of these things are connected. And so when you have um a uh, black men who um who who uh, who aren't uh um um who haven't been given that message or for some reason overcame that message, then it's not looked at as say like a David Hogg is that um, um, that he is a leader and, and within his own right and, right, and you know right. no they're looked at as being potentially violent right. they're looked at as being they're the, looked that, at as a threat it's a threat so you know so these are the things that we have to and I'm and, and I don't think yes it's the responsible responsibility of white people to a certain extent but I also think that is more of a responsibility for black parents black adults. Because, see, that young black boy that I met in the bank 25 years ago, he could have probably overcame whatever disapproving looks he got from white people if the black people in the bank showed that's, him some love. That's it. And, and that actually ties into the study we're going to talk about that, that deals with the racialized income inequality and how it affects black boys in particular. But I want to make it clear, crystal clear, because the more we have this conversation, I see that people are coming in and out of the conversation and they don't hear all of it. We're not criticizing the students from Parkland because, see, I think they get that our voices, our kids' voices have been ignored. Like you said, you know, like you said, David Hogg himself said that his school, Parkland, is 25% black and the media hasn't even 
portrayed Parkland accurately because the only people they ever talked to were the white kids. And they the one Latina. Get it. And the one Latina. And the one Latina. The ki the, these kids did everything they could from what I could see from the outside to make sure that they gave kids who have been fighting this from a different perspective, mm. but who have been trying to make their voices heard and who have been marching for their lives for years longer before they have, but America ignored them. The criticism is not toward the kids. The criticism is for the adults right. and the hypocrisy that even the kids who organized the, this thing saw. And they're pointing it out. So we, we have uh, um, uh, one, one example where, where David Hogg and a few of the kids from Parkland went to the Thurgood Marshall Academy over here in uh, I think it's Southeast DC, uh, poorest ward in the city, poorest neighborhood in the city, 99.9% uh, .9 black. There's probably three white families that live in, <laughs> well, not now, it's more than that because of gentrification. Yeah, but, 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 but half of them is on our street. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but most of the black people in this area are poor. Um, Thurgood Marshall Academy is an important school because it is a school that has a, um, a, a law and social policy, a law and public policy focus that that's the kids who are interested in law and public policy go to Thurgood Marshall Academy mm -hmm. and they train these kids in, in, in preparing them for a career in that because Thurgood Marshall was a former Supreme court justice, right? So these kids at this school in this poor ass neighborhood in Southeast DC, all these black kids from these poor families who have almost all of them have been affected by gun violence. There's a video. We're going to share a link to that video too. Now I'm afraid to play it because I don't think it'll play because there'll probably be something wrong with the video. But David Hogg uh, is speaking at a, 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 um, at an assembly. The, a bunch of the kids from the school are in the auditorium and one of the young men uh, who is a student at the school spoke and asked his classmates, everybody who has been affected by gun violence, raise your hands in honor, raise your hand in honor of uh, the people you lost. And almost every kid in the auditorium raised their hand. Mm. And the two, I think it was three other kids who were with David Hogg, they were all white. They looked around at that auditorium and the look on their face was like, oh my God, who... Oh my God. So the young man who spoke at Thurgood Marshall Academy, um, also spoke at March for our lives as did a few other black activists and, uh, um, uh, native and, and, uh, Latino <laughs> Latinx, uh, activists from around the country, from Chicago, from Baltimore, from New York city spoke at the March for our lives yesterday. So the kids at least are making an effort to show that they get it, that they're not, that this is not a new fight. They're not the only ones who, who have been fighting and, um, that other kids have been ignored and they've said that over and over again. It's not fair that these other kids have been ignored. The criticism is for the adults who continue to ignore that that truth that even though black kids were attended the march and and there were black lives matter chapters who attended the marches in different cities it is still true that nobody paid it well not nobody most of the people who were supportive of these kids and for, for, for the March for our lives didn't give a damn about black lives matter or black kids who have been fighting this all this time. That's just true. And it doesn't matter that it hurts your feelings and that you don't like it. And, and you feel like it's not in, in good taste. Somebody actually said that in response to something that a young black lady who lives in Florida an hour away from Parkland from, from the high school, she went to the high school to help them organize. And then she started thinking, wait a minute. I drove an hour to come to this school to help these kids organize something that I, is important. But when there's a shooting in my neighborhood an hour away, how many of them got in their cars to come help us? 
How many of these people, when we have a protest, came to our city to come and help us? Nobody. So she said that's why she ended up not going to the March for Our Lives. She supports the students, but she also understands that there has not been support for students like her. And, and there are still white people who are just like, oh, that is just so wrong to say. Oh, divided we fall. You're right. Divided we fall. We didn't create the division. You did. You created the division when you completely ignored brown kids marching for their lives, native kids marching for their lives. You created that division. So it's great that the March for Our Lives was as intersectional as it was, and it was. But there are still issues that, that create the situation that produces gun violence that black people face in particular that are still not being addressed just because the march and whatever resulting activities are intersectional. See, because if we don't deal with those issues, then our kids are going to keep dying and y'all going to keep not caring. So let's talk about some of those issues right now. But what do you have to say? Well, I'll, I'll just end on this point that there was there's two major differences that I've seen with um, the way that Parkland uh, activists have been treated uh, uh, opposed to, uh, you know, as um, Black Lives Matter activists have been treated. Number one, the Parkland kids are able to stay on their issue. The Parkland kids are able to stay on, on their issue of gun control um, and, 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 and more you know, protection for mm -hmm. school stuff. Black Lives Matter kids had to, they had, Black Lives Matter, um, Matter kids had to basically explain their politics. Mm. Come on. Black Lives Matter kids had to explain that they weren't against the police. Mm-hmm. They had to explain that they're not against white people, that they're not racist, that they're not that they didn't order the murder of police. Right. They um uh, Black Lives Matter kids had to confront police unions, mm. politicians, mm. and mm -hmm. everyone else who tried to paint them as a terrorist organization. They were not allowed to stay on issue. Right. Because all of the and and this is what how racism works. Racism works the fact that you have to have all of these other diversionary issues because we don't want to deal with the real issue. Right. So our kids had to deal with all the diversionary issues. Mm -hmm. They had to get in front of white folks and say, we're not violent. Mm -hmm. We just want to stop being murdered by police. Mm -hmm. They had to get in front of politicians. We're not against the police. We didn't order the murder of any police. We're not this and we're not that. And what was lost was why they formed in the beginning. That's right. Now, That's see, right. now the thing of it is, is that the Parkland kids, they didn't have to go through that. Nope. They are allowed. Nobody's questioning. Oh, you got a few yahoos out there that's trying to, you know, uh, question them about wanting to dismantle the Second Amendment. <laughs> but even else, but, e but, but, but I'm going to tell you something. But even the yahoos are being pushed at bay by the amount of protection that these kids are getting from everybody else. Exactly. Our kids was left out there to fend for themselves. That's right. They was left out there to fend for themselves because there weren't a whole lot of people coming to their aid and saying that, um, you know, and, and allowing them to um, remain on issue. Exactly. And that's the thing. So those are the two major things I see. Every, and, and we said this on this show constantly, black descent in this country has always been viewed as a threat. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. it continues to be viewed as a threat. That's right. So that's the reason why Oprah didn't want to give up no money. <laughs> reason why y'all don't want to give up no money. But that's the reason why Oprah don't want to give up no money. That's the reason why there wasn't no, um, uh, uh, um, uh, no, the Patriots didn't offer their plane. Right. That was the reason why there wasn't um, the CBC didn't want to. Didn't want, and that's not, the reason not for black kids. Not for black kids. And that's the reason why Obama, instead of um, giving the this the the the, the um, the approval that he gave to the Parkland kids, like, oh, we were waiting for you. But he tells Black Lives Matter kids that, well, you just can't go around yelling at people. <laughs> that all takes me back to that bank 25 years ago. Oh, my God. It all <laughs> takes me back to that bank. And the thing of it is, is that it's internalized racism. You don't even need white folks to do it anymore. It's internalized Damn. racism that we give to our own kids and, tell, and, 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 and it's a subconscious way that we give to our own kids that somehow... Um, um, you know, uh, what, what you do uh, has to be done different. We teach mm -hmm. our kids that they have to conform. 
We teach our kids that they have to conform and work with work within this racist system. Yep. Where for the most part, most white children, not all, but mm -hmm. most white children are told that you are entitled to have the kind of country you want. Mm-hmm. That's we right. are we there. You're entitled to have the country you want, whether it's conservative and to fight or, for it and to change it if you right, don't like it. Right. Whether it's conservative or whether it's liberal, whatever your politics are, then you have the right to have the country you want. Mm -hmm. The message that black kids get <laughs> and black people in general is you just better be lucky that we ain't shipping your ass back to Africa. That, so yep. the thing of it is, <laughs> is that just be good citizens, mm -hmm. work hard, keep your head, get down. your education, put your head down, stay in church. And stay away from them crazy Negroes, and then you <laughs> should be all right. Crazy, and maybe, Negroes. and maybe, one of us benevolent white folks will choose you to be the next one, and then you'll have success in our country. Because mind you, black people don't get nowhere in this country unless white people choose them. Oh, so that is the God. thing. I don't care what kind. <laughs> I don't care what kind of education you have. Man. I don't care where you come from, unless white folks choose you and anoint you. In the name of God, St. Michael and St. George. <laughs> Unless you get that, then you ain't, look, look. I mean, you you, you can make it in America, but you ain't going to be Oprah Winfrey. No. You ain't going to be none of them unless white folks chose you. Those so, slots are filled. Right, unless white people choose you. So that is the existence that we have in this country. And this is the the the, um, the message that a lot of our children receive and th because that's what we give them. We give them that the best that you can ever do in this country is not ask to change the country, but just get everything you can so at least you got a shot. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, maybe, and, maybe, and maybe you might stand out and that one white person and, will choose you. Right. Maybe white people will choose you and, and amplify you, which is, which is part of the frustration with the response to the March for Our Lives. It's not enough to just say to, to our kids, well, look, uh, black kids were, the, we, black kids were allowed to participate. You must be out your mind. Well, yeah, yeah of course <laughs> I mean, allowed to participate, I mean, but. I mean, so, okay, so that, that's not, because we could keep going on that, but let's talk about these issues. One of these issues, like we talked about uh, last week with uh, mass incarceration, with incarceration, why incarceration has played such an enormous role in the oppression, the perpetual and continued oppression of black people. It was intentional. Please go back and watch that show. Cannot rehash all that information. It's way too much information. Um, from the first show, housing. How housing and denial of equal opportunity to housing both in buying a home and in where we live in general was intentionally done to disenfranchise black people. No, none of this, no, where we are, how we're seen, how we're treated in this country, how we're portrayed, none of it is an accident. It has all been intentional and unemployment is another example of that. 50 years ago, the Kerner Commission was convened to uh, investigate why there were all of these uh, civil unrest uprisings in cities in the North. And uh, the Johnson administration, Lyndon Johnson, expected the commission to come back and say, well, it's the black radicals that are stirring up the black people. You know, it's those Muslims of the nation of Islam. The Muslims. <laughs> no, that's right, because they, they, could, they couldn't get that right either. It's, the, it's those Muslims. And it's those black radicals, the Black Panther Party, and that they're riling them. No, what these white congressmen found had no reason to lie. They had every reason to come back and say, yep, it's the Negroes. But they didn't. What they found was, no, it's government and white American racism. It is white American racism that has been perpetuated by centuries and decades upon decades of racist policies that have been targeted at black people, excluding them from participating in American society equally and fairly. That's what the Kerner Commission found. Kerner Commission wrote up a report saying that politics need to be used to implement legislation to address unfair employment, unfair housing, unfair uh, incarceration, even then, 50 years ago. And what happened? Our <coughs> government didn't do it. Didn't do it. So now, 50 years later, after the Kerner Commission report, 
accurately and very detailed, in a very detailed fashion, pointed out the issues that black people face then that we're still facing now. We have a situation now where uh, uh, in February last month, people were all just gaga over the really low unemployment numbers among black people. Mm. Ooh, the unemployment rate in February was the lowest that it's been since 1972. Did you know that the Department of Labor actually didn't track black unemployment before 1972? No, I didn't. Yes, this is true. Uh, uh, the Department... <laughs> So what do they do? Just ride around the corner and see how many of us were standing out there? I think that there? they must have. They must have like sent somebody like down to the hood, like across the bridge in, in D.C. and said to see if anybody was hanging on the corner. Hey, there are 10 black men hanging on the corner uh, today. The and, it's, people, um, and it's between banker hours. So we hey, don't have no all job, the right? black men. Yeah. So, so people were just crazy over, oh, the, uh, black unemployment is, is the lowest it's been in decades and yay Donald Trump. And we talked about in another show why Trump doesn't get any credit for that, number one, because unemployment in general has been on the decline for several years. Um, but another reason why Trump and no president gets the credit for black unemployment rate being low is because even though the black unemployment rate was 6.8%, and it is true that that was the lowest it has been since 1972, the black unemployment rate was still twice as high as that of white Americans. Yeah. So why are you celebrating? What the heck were people celebrating? <laughs> I don't understand what people were celebrating. Black people didn't have um, full employment um, <laughs> since slavery. It's <laughs> <laughs> the truth. You know, I mean, that was the last time we had full employment. And, and, if, we, and if we really look at... Um, if you really want to be honest about the unemployment um, uh, mm -hmm. situation with black America, uh -huh. trace it from um, the end of slavery to Reconstruction and see that ever since um, we were so-called free of the plantation, <laughs> we ain't had full employment since. Uh, look, I know that sounds funny. It does. But it is true. That is also not like saying, well, we had it better when we were slaves. No, that is an indication that the system was designed to keep us unemployed. Well, even more, it's, a, it's an indication of a system that had no use for us set after slavery. Oh, that's a, that is even better. Yeah. See, he's we were, so we good were at never, that. We were never intended to be assimilated. So that's the reason why employment, and, and, and if you mm -hmm. look at the, one, the Jim Crow part and after slavery, the reason why it was so many loitering laws, what well, we call them loitering laws now, right? but um, sun, sundown laws. Uh-huh. And all of this, uh, all of these um, uh, penalties for for black people congregating and all this stuff and and being locked up because you know because uh, you didn't have anywhere nothing else to do. Right. That was all. Um, that was that was really saying to us that now that you're not slaves anymore, we have no use for you. You know, because we were born here for labor. We were mm. born here as a labor class of people. So now. We can't work y'all for free no more. So we really, and this country was not built intended. Uh, you were not intended to be a part of what, you know, what what, what we would like to be the United States. Because I like what Dr. Greg Carr said. I put it on my page. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as the United States of America. It's an aspirational concept. It's the, the fact that, and that's the reason why the founding fathers always said that we would like to have a more perfect union. But that perfect union didn't mean... Um, um, a diverse population that hmm. perfect union meant that we wanted as perfect for white folks as we could so there there was never any intention and the, and the Dred Scott decision told us that mm -hmm. that there was never any intention for um, black people to become a part of the society so that is one of the reasons why our unemployment the unemployment rate amongst black people consistently remain high it consistently remain high because the message is is that you you know we don't have any use for you anymore yep. you know what i mean so america has been banging itself against the head when i say america i'm talking about the people in power been having having been banging themselves uh, uh in the head about what to do with this excess slave with with this former slave population we mm -hmm. have we no longer need mm -hmm. and that's the reason why there 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 were eugenics programs aimed at us 
that was the reason why that um, um, during the early part of the 20th century, why some white folks who didn't know any better just outright tried to massacre us, you know, the Red Summer 1919 mm-hmm. and all that other thing. Mm-hmm. So when, you know, you couldn't kill all of us and you couldn't sterilize all of us. Mm-hmm. And then that's and then we go into modern era, man, with mass incarceration. All of these are not um, responses to crime. All right. of this is responses of people in power on what do we do with this excess slave population mm-hmm. who we don't need anymore, and yet they keep reproducing. We don't know what to do with them. We don't really want them here. That's and that Malcolm is it. said that. Malcolm said the problem with America is that <laughs> that she doesn't want us. So we've been constantly appealing to the morality of Americans, and we've been constantly appealing to the morality of the politician stuff, not understanding that. Um, in order to appeal to somebody's morality, they have to have a, they have to be moral in the in the beginning. Right, right. But when you have already determined as a country that there's a population here that that um, um, that you don't want here, and that's where all of this stuff comes in. That mm-hmm. so you know so black people we have to really we have to get real with what our position here and that and that's where we fail yes. this has nothing yes. to do with white folks yep where we fail that is that we do not have an understanding of of what our role is here that's right and 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 in order for us to map out a strategy um uh, uh because i'm not part of that crowd that says oh we all we all we all we just all to leave and build somewhere else nah man this country benefited from the slave labor benefited for, and, and we spoke about this earlier not just from the labor of, of our slave ancestors but it also benefited from the genius of our ancestors exactly. who came up with, with 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 products and inventions and 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 technological inventions that helped make this country great so it's not just just um um, um the physical labor mm-hmm. it's also intellectual property right. so anytime the government and and those a lot of the intellectual property was stolen by white people so you have a lot of people white people who have patents on stuff that they didn't even invent mm-hmm. they took that from their slaves they right. took that from people that they that they own so that wasn't even theirs so the, there's no way as a descendant of those people that i'm just going to just give this all up and say okay well i'll move somewhere else no my inheritance is here and I'm not going to leave until I get my inheritance. Exactly. Now, if you want me to leave, then pay me what you <laughs> then owe. Pay and what it's a big you planet. Owe. It's a big planet. Pay me what you owe, and then I will gladly look around the globe and find somewhere else to settle. Yep. But until then, I'm not going anywhere. And I think that this is something that black people, we are ever um, are going to be, um, 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 to map a, a political course in this country. The first thing we have to do is deal with the reality of what our status is here. Yeah. And and for a lot of, for too many uh, uh, black people, that's a really hard pill to swallow. But there is no way that you can look at not even just, not, not even just the history of the way we've been treated by this country, but, but the way we're, treat, we're treated right now. How, how are you going to look at the way this country responded to our kids fighting for their lives as opposed to the march for our lives and not come to the conclusion that, oh, wait, they really do hate us. <laughs> I mean, how do you not come to that conclusion? I don't understand how you... So, so I don't understand. I can't get with black activists who are still trying to get white people to do stuff because it's the right thing to do. I don't care whether you think the legislation we need to address is the right thing to do or not. Not my concern. I don't care how you personally feel about it. I just know it needs to be done. Because if, if, it's, if it isn't done, then you are not going to get what you need to address your... That's just how it works. You can't fix... If the foundation of a building is crumbling and you've got repairs that need to be done on the second and fifth and eighth floors, you can't fix the stuff on the second, eighth, and fifth floors and expect the building not to fall over that's if true. you haven't looked at the foundation that's crumbling. Black people and native people are the foundation of this damned country. You don't fix our problems, your building falls. That's just how it is. And and if black activists don't take that perspective and get away from the appealing to people's mo- mo- uh, morality, we're going to stay stuck. Mm. So when we're looking at uh, uh, the unemployment pictures and please, uh, uh, unemployment issue, please excuse my wiping my eyes. You guys, I got a sty that won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
when we're looking at, at, at black unemployment in this country, um, it's not just unemployment. We're talking about a, a black and white pay and hiring gap uh, that has existed for decades. That's another reason why that 6.8% mm -hmm. unemployment rate that was so low was bullshit. <laughs> Because we know doggone well, we just talked about a couple of years ago, like last year, but there were studies that came out that employers were twice as likely to hire people that had white sounding names on their oh, resume, yeah, yeah. as opposed to people who had black sounding names, exact same qualifications. So don't tell me this country is all about merit. Stop it with the meritocracy bullshit. Well, then we, then we say, that. But then we say on, um, on the podcast yesterday oh. that... Had Barack Obama would have been named Michael Jones from Chicago, <gasps> he'd have never been elected president. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, so again, yeah, look, we would rather have somebody whose name we can't pronounce <laughs> than elect one of you Negroes that, uh, uh, who got who who has a name that we gave you. <sighs> you know what I mean? So we gave you that name, and we rather have somebody's name we can't pronounce. <laughs> I mean, so we still gonna run around talking about that that everybody has equal opportunity in this country. How is that possible when studies have shown that employers will hire John Smith or Chad Jones over Jamal Jones? And Chad and Jamal have the exact same resume. And, and just as a side note, um, for the, those of you who don't know already, uh, my name, Abdushahi Lukman, is a name that I chose. This was not my birth name. He got rid of his slave yeah, name. Yeah, my, my, my English slave name, um, <gasps> you know, I got rid of that. But the thing of it is, is that, and it was for political reasons why I did it. But just to show you how yesterday we talked about um, uh, Negroism versus yeah, being black. Uh-huh. And you know, I've been named this name for quite a while now, but I remember every place that I would go to and I would run into white people, you know, Americans, and they would say, oh, what's your name? Or, you know, somehow, we, you know, what's mm -hmm. your name? Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when I tell them, when I tell them my name, they say, oh, well, where are you from? Uh -huh. I said, well, I'm from America. And they look from America. <laughs> what's your name again? Oh, you from <laughs> oh, okay. Well, where's your parents from? I right. said, my parents are from here. Mm -hmm. No, no. Well, uh, um, well, where's your grandparents from? My grandparents are from here, too. I know where they're getting at. Yep. They yep. was like, you oh, wait a minute. Comes from. If you yep. get, if you from. If you've been here this long, then why, why you ain't got our tag How on your you, neck? Why you, where's, where's the name we gave you? Right, right, since you, right. If you've always but, been but I, but I also But I also noticed that they would treat, they, that I was treated differently. Hmm. And certain places that I worked, when they, when they, um, um, when, when, when it, when it was me, and it was Tyrone Davis or uh -huh, something like that. Uh -huh. I noticed that subconsciously, so um, you know, some of the whites in charge of stuff would treat me differently, and um, because they they assumed that I was from somewhere else. Right. So you know, so right. the thing of it is, is that we said this on the podcast yesterday about how black people in this country are perceived as opposed to black people from other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about the American Negro mm. that white people in this country for the, for the longest time have um, um, basically uh, ran our names in the dirt around <laughs> the world to the point yep. where, um, and, 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 you know, to the point where, and don't think that, that this is hyperbole that I'm saying. I ran into Africans who came from other countries mm -hmm. who would tell me that they were warned by our own embassy to stay away from us. Mm -hmm. I've seen, I've heard um, on quite a few occasions, African immigrants who I might have worked with or we, we became friends. And they would tell me, they said, you know, when we first came to this country, the, your embassy would tell us to avoid black Americans because we won't be safe around them. Uh, yeah, I you mean, know what I mean. Now we're supposed to be citizens of this country, yet right. we got the State Department giving them warnings about well, don't 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 mess with them folks. Don't <laughs> and I've had immigrants uh, and, and travelers to this country tell me this. I mean, just recently, um, I caught a uh, cab uh, one day from somewhere, and the cab driver was an African immigrant. Don't know which country in Africa he came Africa he came from. I can't remember where, but he told me. I just can't remember, and. He usually, he said, I usually do not go into that area of the city where right. we live, but you seem like a nice lady, so I'll take you. I'm like, yo, okay, I, I, I know the drill. Okay, fine. That's, that's nice. I'm supposed to be thankful for that. Whatever. So 
he he's driving into our neighborhood and this man is looking out the window and he's he says this he says oh the homes here are quite nice like he's shocked yeah. like he's surprised mm-hmm. that the negroes don't actually graffiti their own fucking houses <laughs> we all don't live in projects and all this other you kind know of oh the homes here are quite nice and they're quite nicely kept. Right. And the lawns are very nicely kept. This don't look like boys in the hood to me. <laughs> and, and, you know, I didn't want him to, like, drive off with me somewhere. So I waited until we got in front of our house. And, you know, dude is driving through our neighborhood. He's like, oh, well, this is quite nice. It looks very quiet. And blah, blah, blah. And he stops in front of the house. And I said, yeah, despite what you may have heard about black people in this country we're not animals so maybe you need to change the way you think about your cousins because we're related oh my god he was just so ashamed of himself oh i'm so sorry i'm so i no, i don't mean to offend but you did though but they get but see the thing of it is they but, get that information but they get from that there. information from people who portray us in a certain light yep. and they have a reason for doing it and, and it is nothing more than to another way to deal with this, um, what is it called? Is it, what, what do we call the excess population? Yeah. Or the, uh, uh, the excess isn't the word, it'll come to me in a minute. And, and part of it is, and, and, and I'll end on this point, part of it is also to disconnect us. I mean, look, we were brought over here, and the first thing that they did when they brought us over here was to disconnect us from any part of mm-hmm. our, our ancestor roots. So that means right. that we weren't allowed to tell stories from Africa. Right. We weren't allowed to know where we came from. We weren't allowed and, and we already know historically that this this was done from a German who taught the southern plantation owners who because every time um and this is just a brief history, y'all bear with me. Um uh before they started disconnecting us from our history, um Africans in America were telling their stories and like other people do and they weren't making good slaves mm-hmm. because they kept telling their stories mm-hmm. of resistance and everything mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. So what happened was there was a German guy. I can't remember his name right now, but we'll get it for you. And he was known for, um, you know, being you know knowledgeable of how to um, make better slaves or whatever like that. Mm-hmm. So these um, uh, Southern plantation owners went to Germany and spoke to this guy. And what happened was he told him, he said, you know, the reason why you guys are having problems is because you, you, you're you allowing them to tell their story. Mm-hmm. You're allowing them to still have con- have connections to their, to their homeland. Mm-hmm. They're never going to make good slaves. You have to cut them off from that. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons why America didn't import <laughs> as many. Now, look at the way that Af- the African, um, uh, us, l- look at how the African population in America is versus African population in Brazil. The, Car- the Caribbean and right. everywhere else. That's right. You will find more Africanness mm. in Brazil, in the Caribbean, everywhere else that black people are outside of the continent, you will find more Africanness, but you won't find that in America. And the reason why you don't find black people with as much Africanness as opposed to everywhere else in the diaspora because of what this German guy said. That's and right. what the slave plantations did was the first thing they did was they cut off importation of new slaves. Mm-hmm. And they started having breeding farms. Mm-hmm. So when you're bred from another slave on a breeding farm, there's no stories to tell. That's right. No. You know, all you know is slavery. All you know that your parents are slaves. Uh, and, you, and, and this is what America did. So they started having these breeding farms and they stopped importing new Africans mm-hmm. into America. Mm-hmm. Made it illegal, matter of fact. Right. And so um, what happens is the stories weren't told. And then the connection of language, connection of stories connection and anything of and connection and of history. And- was all cut. And so that is one of the reasons why that you don't see the amount of Africanness in African American That's right. as you see in um, others in the diaspora. So, you know, so this this was very important. And so when a lot of us um, started saying that we was trying, we were going to reclaim some of that back, mm-hmm. um, um, whether we changed our names or whether we did this and whether we did that. And I remember using uh, Malcolm's line, and I'll end with this, is I remember when um, I went to go change my paperwork after I got my new name and I gave the lady, um, nice white lady, and we sit and talking and stuff. And she said, well, why would you change your name? Your name is such a beautiful name. Well, won't your, your father get mad at you if you change your name? Uh, change his name? Uh-huh. I said, well, my father don't know his name. And she said, well, what do you mean your father don't know his name? I said, my father's name, I said, my father was given the name of the people that owned us. 
And I said, and mm-hmm. you know, I don't want that legacy on me anymore. So I don't know who this guy is. Um, mm-hmm. And I said, and I don't know who his family was. Mm-hmm. Talking about the old slave owners. Right. This man could be dead somewhere in Virginia somewhere. And even though his family might not even exist, his legacy is still on me. Exactly. I don't want it. Exactly. And so it ends with me. You know, so... um. So that was my reason for doing it. But what I'm saying is, is that that is one of the reasons why African-Americans for, in particular are looked at differently, even by blacks in the diaspora, because we have been made a totally whole, a totally new people. Mm, and that's yeah. the Negro. Yes. Nobody, no other black person in, in, in the world was referred to as Negro. That's true. There, there have there have been derisive terms used in other places for black people, but... Never nowhere did. else, nowhere else created a new people from black people. They treat you, you know. So, um, a surplus population. That's what I was right. looking for. Um, so that that's that that is the social conditioning that we're operating in. We got to deal with all of that, and then on top of that, we got to deal with with this this beast of unemployment. That is particularly pernicious. There's that word that I love that y'all are like, ooh, that's a big word. It's really not that complicated. Um, that is particularly per- pernicious in how it affects black men. Because here is here is what is true. White people who graduated high school but who don't have a college degree have the lowest unemployment rate among everybody. Mm. All in this is what this means. All white people in this country have to do is graduate high school and they can probably get a job that'll support their family. But for black people who do the exact same thing not only do they have a higher unemployment rate, but when they do get a job, they earn less money than white people. And this is true even more for black men. And a new study came out that is frightening to me. Mm. Frightening. I mean, I read the synopsis of the study and I started reading the study and I could not stop crying. I mean, I was emotional because... I recognize that we've always, it's like when, when somebody finally confirms what you have always known, it's like this relief, but then there's like this dread that sets in because then you wonder what are people going to do about it? Mm -hmm. See, because with black people, people have always taken information about the way black people are treated in this country and they've always used it against us because see with the Kerner commission, report that's what the that's what the the conservatives did Mm -hmm. they took that report and cherry picked it and also the Moynihan uh, report report, cherry picked it and used it against black people and 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 I I am I am so I was reading this report and the synopsis of it and I was just I was blown away by how bad it really is for black men in particular. And I have to make this clear. Black women do make less money than white women. The the report bears that out. But the income gap between white women and black women Mm -hmm. is not anywhere near as wide as the income gap between white men and black men. Mm. It is so bad for black men that even black boys who are born and raised into rich families are more likely to end up living in poverty as adults. Let me see if I can, I'm hoping this graphic works so you can see what's going on with this graphic. This is from a New York Times article that gives a synopsis of this report. Um, And as you can see, they studied, uh, I think it's 10,000 boys from 10,000 different families, all wealthy, all rich, 10,000 rich families. Mm. 
That's where all of these little dots start off. They grew up rich. <clears throat> Most white boys raised in wealthy families will stay rich or upper middle class as adults. But black boys raised in similarly rich households will not. And if you are paying attention to the little um, squares as they filter through the different class strata, mm -hmm. I think that's how you pronounce the multiple of stratus. You can see that the yellow indicates white men, the blue indicates black men. Um, most of the children who grew up rich, who stay rich, are white. The black children who grow up rich a higher percentage of them end up poor. And I'm just going to let this continue to play so you can see where these 10,000 boys who all grew up rich. And this study was conducted over several years. Mm -hmm. Where these children ended up. <clears throat> I want you to take a really good look at that. People call America the land of opportunity and everybody has an equal shot. Everybody has equal opportunity and we can, we can, if we all work hard, then we can all make something of ourselves. If that is true, how is it that even black children who grow up with every advantage black boys, how is it that 21% of them grow up to be poor adults? Mm. How is that true? Over 17% that grow up and stay in the upper class, in the wealthy class. How is that true? If all things are equal in this country, now, these 10,000 families, according to this study, similar incomes, similar neighborhoods, um, similar households. Education, right? Similar educations. Everything was very much similar. One of the things that was really interesting in the result of the study was that for girls, mm -hmm. for black girls they fared better than black boys mm. in the same situation. Black girls did not, black girls who grew up in wealthy families were more likely to remain wealthy as adults. Even considering things like an unplanned pregnancy. So if all things are equal, why do black boys who grow up rich face more of a threat to ending up a poor adult? We talked about it last week. One of those things is incarceration. Mm -hmm. Mass incarceration is one of those reasons. Another, uh, a couple more reasons, and there are some other uh, charts here, because you know how I love my charts. <clears throat> large income gaps persist between men, but not women. All right. So, so when we're talking about systemic racism in this country, not only can we not just leave it, I'm sorry, when we're talking about income inequality in this country, mm -hmm. not only can we not just talk about income inequality, just generally, we have to talk about the racial component to it. Right. And when we are talking about systemic racism in this country, we cannot ignore the plight of black men. We can't. Because it is the economic 
situation of black men. It is the economic plight of black men that drives the economic inequality for black people. And if we are just waking up to black men being the, the key and the foundation to the health of the black community, I am telling you that white supremacy has always known that shit. That's why black men have always been targeted first and worse. Now, I, I understand that for many black women who are very into intersectional feminism right now, that that's not a popular thing to say. That we can't focus on black men because black women have issues too. The issue is not that black women don't have issues. When we're talking about how the system targets black people, we cannot ignore that the system targets black men in particular. The data bears this out. So let's see, let me go down here. Let's scroll down some. Here's an interesting part of this study that, that conservatives are misconstruing, and I'm seeing them do it already. Mm -hmm. There's a part of the study that says that uh, one of the ways that they have found that combat this outcome for black boys uh, to, to grow up in poverty is the presence of black fathers in the community. Now, the study makes it clear that the answer is not that black women need to get married and that there need to be black men in the home. Which is what the conservative talking point is always but is. That's always the conservative talking point. Now, we will obviously admit that if you are poor and you have two incomes in the household, that's better than one income all by yourself. Right. But it is still true that black people who are married still fare worse than white people who are married under the exact same economic and social conditions. So getting married doesn't make life better for black people. We still broke. But the key thing about this study, excuse me, and I have to go, let me click over here because I actually highlighted it and I'll read it to you because I can, they explain it much better than I do. Uh, this is an uh, this is from an article called "Is It Race or Class?" and it's from uh, the American Prospect. So they say, but the researchers of the new study weighted uh, weighed data concerning nearly every American between 1989 and 2015. That's how long they did this study to consider income disparities between parent and child, and thus upward mobility. They found that compared to white social mobility, Hispanic upward mobility is improving and Asian American mobility matches or is better than the mobility of white Americans. But the chance of a black or Native American child rising through the income ranks is much lower than that of a white child. In fact, black Americans and Native Americans have higher rates of downward mobility compared to other groups. A black child born to a family in the wealthiest quintile is about as likely to fall into the poorest quintile than to remain in their original economic class. The researchers also find that when parental income is similar, individual black women's wages and work hours are comparable to those of white women, meaning the black white generational income gap is driven entirely by the incomes of men. Mm. Man, that's something. This is not an accident. This isn't like a bunch of people sitting in a room go, hey, let's pass some policies that, that are just going to fuck with black people. And then 20, 50 years later, they're like, hey, we've really screwed black men over in particular. Right. That's a great byproduct. No, they went after black men intentionally, knowing that this would be the outcome. The study is significant in that the results point to income disparities that cut across generations. People are always talking about generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And these black folks and their entrepreneur pushers and the savings pushers and the investment pushers talking about all we need to do to get generational wealth is to start your own business and save and invest. Bullshit. And this is why. 
The study is significant in that the results point to income disparities that cut across generations and that can't be explained by parental income, wealth, education, or geography, as would be expected in neighborhoods with low poverty and better school resorts, results, black boys and white boys fare better than average. But the outcome gap between the races still remains large, suggesting that white boys benefit more from the resources in those neighborhoods. The mass incarceration of black men as compared to white men is another gap that transcends parental income because law enforcement and the justice system targets black boys. Mm -hmm. Even though we know white boys, Chad and them sitting in their mama and daddy's house doing heroin, Jamal is the one who's going to get locked up well, for possessing pot. Well, Chad has something that Jamal doesn't have a lot of times too, and that's social capital. Right. Because Chad's dad probably knows the judge. <laughs> They go to they they go off together. Uh, let's see, where was I? Oh. While one in five black men born to parents in the poorest quintile are incarcerated on a given day, only one in sixteen white men born to the poorest parents are incarcerated. Incarceration rates fall as parental income rises, but among the wealthiest one percent of families, two point two percent of black men are incarcerated. Your wealth black people will not insulate you from white supremacy. It doesn't. The same incarceration rate for white men born to families making $36,000. Just as many rich black men are locked up as are poor white trash. And I say poor white trash, not as a disparaging comment, but repeating what white people have said to me about the way the system treats poor white people. All right. The few places where black boys have better outcomes than average and where the gap between black and white is smaller are defined by two general features. Low levels of racial animosity among whites. <laughs> and a greater presence of black fathers, not necessarily a boy's own father. <sighs> Lord. So the I first so the first one is what we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. The fact that it says low racial animosity amongst whites. Uh -huh. Number one is whites have to choose you. You get That's white people need to stop being racist and they have to choose to give a damn about you. Right, so that's the low <laughs> that's the low racial animosity. The second one I thought was very interesting because, like you said, the conservative talking point has always been the magical black fathers. The, if, oh. the, if the if the fathers were in the home, um, if black women got married more, um, if if you know all of these other things, uh, but mm -hmm. mainly if, if you know if black fathers oh. uh, fathers was in the home. And I remember one of our Facebook friends sent me an article mm -hmm. that was written um, Atlantic Black Star or something. <laughs> they can be sketchy sometimes. Well, this one was sketchy <laughs> because it said the seven ways that black fatherhood has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I took issue with that. I read the article, mm -hmm. which a lot of folks don't, but I read the article and I seen where the person who wrote the article were basically relying on the same lies and, and uh, untruths that other people have used to disparage the black community. Mm -hmm. So I have responded to this person. I said, first of all, I read the article mm -hmm. and I take issue with it. Black fatherhood has never been destroyed. Not in the sense that they were trying to make. Right. It's never been destroyed. The CDC came out already mm -hmm. a couple of years ago mm -hmm. with a study that says that black fathers are more engaged with their children, whether they live with the mother or they don't. Exactly. Now, now the CDC uh, pointed this out. And we had, we had covered that study here a couple of times. But that, again, just like with Black Lives Matter, just like with anything else, um, there, it, there is the truth and mm -hmm. there is the shit that <laughs> racists want to believe. Right. Again, right. there is the truth and then there is the shit that racists want to believe. And no matter how much that this study by the CDC has been promoted mm -hmm. by good folks mm -hmm. uh, on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. it's still this narrative that black fatherhood is destroyed that black kids are, are um, um, not doing well because black fathers aren't in the homes and blah, 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 even though the data suggests otherwise. It, right. You know, so so again, I thought that 
um, what you just read that I thought that was very important that there was two components mm -hmm. that um, they said that would kind of help out a little bit. And one is the fact that of, of low racial animosity, mm -hmm. right? And yep. the other, and we all, and look, those of us who's been around a while, we know, um, again, that because we are in a lower um, um, social uh, status in this country, that the majority society, white people mm -hmm. in the society, that when you find favor with them and they're able, and not that all white people can give you favors, but in most places where you find yourself um, um, in, in a position where white people are, are, are in the position of giving you favors, mm -hmm. if you find favor with them, you, you're, you, you do better. You know, if you don't, then your life is a living hell. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I mean, so what I'm saying is, is the fact that this only happens to powerless people yep, in this country. That, that is and it. And again, it goes back to, um, uh, like I said yesterday on the podcast, um, that the only way that we, and we won't be able to circumvent this stuff or um, within our lifetime because the dynamics have been set so long ago. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the playing board has been designed so long ago. It's amazing when they talk about wealth and they talk about this stuff. And the fact that it also shows that the only reason why so many white families are able, and the white boys and white men in particular, are able to remain in these statuses even uh, uh, then, that is because of government intervention. That's right. That's right. It is because government played a role. It's, it's because not because of that, politics. Yeah, and, and I say that because it's not like white people, um, um, uh, uh, you know, have any magical gifts or anything like that. They're mm -hmm. human beings, just like we yeah. are. But what happens is when you have government that that has rigged the playing field in your favor, mm -hmm. as opposed to anybody else's favor, then of course the results are going to be like that. Exactly. I mean. This study, and, and going back to what you said about, about the, you know, the, the myth of the magical black father, this study makes it clear that it is not that black boys in poor neighborhoods do well only when a father is in the home. No, the study points out that black boys in poor neighborhoods do well when there are fathers in the community. And not just fathers. I mean, good fathers. Good fathers. You, I mean, you can have a it, bum in the home. Right. But <laughs> but if there, is, if there are black men in the community who are taking care of their families and being good men, able to hold a job, mm -hmm. able to provide for their families and kids, having pride in themselves, and, and, and being a, a productive part of the community then that's what black boys need to succeed. Not necessarily that there needs to be a father in the home that somebody can uh, uh, tick off on the census as head of household. No, that's not what the study says. But you know why that is so critically important? Because of the last show we did. Because of mass incarceration. Because of all of the black men who have been taken out of our communities through mass incarceration and who, when they came back to our communities, they couldn't get a job you know, because of their record. You know, I remember a story um, in New York City mm -hmm. when um, the New York City Fire Department was sued because of their discrimination against um, black employees, yep. uh, uh, black, black applicants. Mm -hmm. They weren't employees, black right. applicants. Right. They did an estimate that says that the racism of the N NYFD, New York Fire Department, mm -hmm. towards black applicants cost the black community $20 million in, in potential income. So here you have a group of people that's already on the bottom rung, the sec next to the bottom rung economically because of discrimination in hiring and pay. When we get a job, we're paid less than white people in general or just across the board all the time, especially black men, black women a little bit, but black men a whole hell of a lot. And then <laughs> when we try, when we try to, to get a good job, to take care of our families, to be a part of that American social fabric, America says, fuck you. We're not giving you nothing. We don't want you to be a part of our American social fabric. And then that, that costs our community. It costs the communities of the people that are discriminated against 
tens of millions of dollars. And we're not just talking about in one year. We're talking about generational wealth. Mm -hmm. Because it's that generational wealth of those good civil servant jobs where people were able to buy modest homes that they could draw on the equity for to pay for their kids' college. Well, I mean, can can you imagine what $20 million, like I said, I mean, there was a private firm that uh, that racism costs, man. It costs. Racism costs. And the thing of it is, is that it's not just you denying somebody a job. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, that opportunity translates into dollars. And, and they said that $20 million was denied the black community just based on uh, the, the racism of the fire department. Now... Do you know what twenty million dollars could have done for a black community in New York and Harlem? The the, the stability that it could have caused families to have, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Um, to make people um, um, to prevent homelessness in certain instances. Right. What I'm saying is, racism has a ripple effect. It's not a just you just saying, oh well, you know, you just can't have this job. The this um, the denying people opportunity has real um, um, uh, uh, tangible. Um, 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 uh, consequences. consequences yeah right. yeah and 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 for black boys in particular who grow up in rich <laughs> I, i'm laughing at this because it is so when you look at this data and of course yes we'll provide you a link to this data too when you look at this data and you see the outcomes for the black children whose whose family supposedly made it right? They're supposed to be the example of this American dream and how it really does work for everybody. Then how come their black boys don't end up with the same outcome that they grew up in? Why is that? And, and if we're talking about intellect, because that's another excuse people use, well, you know, black kids are just not as smart as white kids, or they just don't work as hard as white kids. Then why is it that black girls from the same families, the same wealthy black families, fare better than their brothers. They and, grew up in the same house. And why is it that even even if you take it outside of what, why is it that there's more black girls or black young women in college as opposed to black boys? Why is it that more young black women are receiving, um, uh, uh, are, are able to access higher uh, college education more than black boys do? A lot of colleges don't even reach out to black black young men. So mm-hmm. so um, and and so certain colleges uh, have recognized that and has started to understand that man we're not having a lot of young black men coming to college. But again, this also this this adds to the dis, the the destability the, the um, of the black community because just like I said about um, uh, um, black women looking at a young black man and be like, well, he's not really a man because of the social condition mm-hmm. of how he confronts external problems. Right. The same thing is happening with black women that's coming out of college, making this money, yep. and their peer group, their male peer groups, is, is is struggling. And now they're looking around and saying, well, there's no eligible mates for me to marry. Yep. So, all, so, so we got to understand that all of this social experimentation is designed to keep us always off balance. Exactly. You can't fight racial oppression. You can't fight racial That's oppression it. if you're always off balance. That's what in any warfare, if, if we got our shit together, if black men and black women were able to overcome all of the trauma bombs that mm, they throw at oh us, man. then, and then, then, then you, you're able, we're able to put our stuff together and say, okay, now we could target our energies and stuff towards those that's oppressing us. But you can't target anything against your oppressor if you yourself is always being thrown off balance. And, 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 that's, and that's what all this stuff is. Exactly. All of these policies that we talked about over the past 50 years, all the history that we've talked about that black people have endured over the past four centuries, it has all been intended to keep us off balance so that we can never fight the beast of white supremacy that's that's what it's all that's what it's always been designed to do because they know they can't ship us back (laughs) they tried they do they at there was at one point in the history of this country where white legislators in congress not even not making this up where white legislators in congress argued over what to do with this population of newly uh, emancipated, formerly enslaved people. And part of the argument was we need to ship them mugs back to Africa because I think they're going to kill us all. <laughs> because they knew, they knew 
what they had done to our ancestors. They knew how how horrible how horribly they treated us. Mm-hmm. So there was actually an argument in Congress about shipping our ancestors back to Africa after being here for two and a half centuries, literally building this country, fertilizing this country with our blood and our sweat and our tears, and even fighting for this country that enslaved us, they were going to ship us back. They actually had that argument. But then they felt like, no, we can still use them. But we can't keep them enslaved because we just abolished slavery. So how do we do that? Hmm. Oh, I know. How about if we criminalize everything they do? How about if we make a bunch of new laws that gives us the ability to lock up a bunch of black people and enslave them in a different way? The cities in the South that were burned during the Civil War by the Union Army, who do you think rebuilt those cities? And how do you think they were rebuilt? They weren't rebuilt mostly by uh, willing volunt- you know, willing bands of volunteers. They were rebuilt by re-enslaved black people under the convict lease system. And the centuries-long process of getting black people to this point where we are close to being at zero wealth in under 40 years began way back then. If we continue to confront these issues as if they are not and have not always been the intentional plan for what to do with a surplus population of people and how to keep us from becoming politically solvent and powerful, we will never get from under this. But as black people, we have got to stop being afraid to tell the truth about what we endure under this system because it is the truth. It's unpleasant, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people to hear, but it is the truth. We are under siege and we always have been. And and these things are done to us intentionally and more than half of white America honestly does not care. They know, they don't care. So we can't deal with them. We cannot expect anything from them. It's the rest of you, white America, that y'all need to get up off your asses and demand that your fellow citizens be treated as citizens. Because we're 13% of the population. Still. They're literally, still, that, that's by design too. There literally is only so much we can do without your help, but your help can't be contingent upon us marching to your tune either. These are difficult conversations to have. They are not pleasant. But our survival depends on getting this stuff right. So that's why we do these hour and a half, two hour long videos talking about this stuff and give you eight articles to to read. And that's why. Because our lives depend on this. And it is studies like this that continue to prove the points we have been making over the years that are invaluable to this fight. There's no getting around the fact that we can't deal with, as progressives, we can't keep talking about income inequality without talking about race. It's impossible. And it's insulting if you expect me to vote for any candidate who is a progressive and he doesn't or he or she doesn't have a platform on racial justice in, 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 in their policies. Don't ask me to vote for anybody who is not willing to talk about and address issues that disproportionately affect black people and disproportionately affect black men. Don't ask me because I'm not going to do it. So what are our friends saying? Okay. Last few minutes we got. Um, one friend, the Patricia Gardner, says, uh, "Oh crap! Uh oh! You gonna have to read because <laughs> now the computer's acting up on me. <laughs> the computer's <laughs> mad that yep. that. <laughs> Let me see if I can go over here and and in the last couple of minutes see what you guys are saying. Oh, it really did show all kinds of off over there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Let me see. Uh... No, I think you had some on, on um, YouTube. Yeah, I'm and, and I'm slow over here. So Lisa Lisa had to go. We hate that you had to go too. Oh, Bonnie Bonnie Flournoy brought up a great point when we were talking about uh, the way that sometimes Black Americans are looked at suspiciously, even by immigrants from Africa. Uh, Bonnie said, "What did Malcolm X say? They know how to say nigger before they get off the boat." Uh, he did say that. I mean, that was then. That was an issue then. So this this is not like a new phenomenon, this this disconnect between African Americans and, and our African uh, cousins. Uh, what else we got over there? All right, I got Patricia Gardner. She said, you did build this country. It is more yours than the rich men that used you as tools to further themselves. Um, that's why I won't leave. I mean, yeah. I mean... I mean, that, that's true, Patricia. I mean, um, I would say that um, this country is just as much ours um, as it is anybody else's. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and I think that not only that we built the country, but I, that as I always remind people, we also defended it. Right. You know, right. and we defended this country in every war. We fought mm -hmm. for the, the War of Independence. We were in that war, mm -hmm. and we were in every war since. That's so, right. I mean, so... Um, not only did we build it, we defended it. So, mm -hmm. you know, so that I agree with you on that. Um, down here. Yep. Dolores P. Pierce. She said Parkland kids had media support. DNC had fundraising booths this weekend. Uh, okay. I, you know, but she's right about, I don't know so much about the DNC, but I know that Parkland kids, <laughs> they indeed have, have uh, media support. Mm -hmm. So that is true. And, um, and we didn't. Lisa Catlin said, Dr. Joy DeGroy speaks about this mm. um, post-traumatic stress syndrome and how yes. it's connected to the behaviors carried over from slavery. So, we, I mean, we got people who've done the work. Um, we have people mm -hmm. who, um, um, who looked into this who are a lot smarter than me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, yeah, the, and, the, and the material exists out there. The late Francis Quest Welsing, yep. others, you know. Um, we just have to be willing um, to... to um, go and 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 consume this 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 information and um as i said earlier um it, it's it's not um let me see okay i'll read one more mm -hmm. um uh sorry computer um veronica let me see veronica and um she thanked us and said it was a good show thank you so, thank you veronica thank you. Thank but you. but this is the thing um as we stated earlier um, this is not, we, we take pride in, 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 in the material that we present because we understand that, yeah, it's easy. It's easy to, to, it's easy to do what's easy. What I'm saying is, is the <laughs> fact it's easy to sit up there and say, well, what's the hot topic that progressives want to hear? Or right. we'll jump on that. Or what's this? Or what's that? That's the easy way out. What's hard is um, um, is fighting for an oppressed population mm -hmm. in a sincere, non sellout way. Yeah, and that's yeah. what's hard. What's hard is bringing you this. How do you think we feel when we see those graphs? Because those graphs <laughs> represent us. Exactly. So how do you think we feel? <laughs> so it's easy to, to chuck that to the side and be like, you know, kumbaya, we're all progressives, and Unity. you know, run Bernie, run, and all this other kind of stuff. That stuff is easy. What's hard is to take this type of material, which is sobering to us, and to present it to um, and to present it to you all, because we do that because we because we still have faith in this country that this does not have to be our reality. Yeah, yeah. And so, and in order for this not to be our reality, then we have to information and education is power. Mm -hmm. So we have faith that this does not have to be our reality, and so this is what we present it to you. And again. It's it's reward. It has to be personally rewarding, which it is for us. Mm -hmm. Because trust me, man, white progressive will starve you out. <laughs> no, I mean, no, and I'm not saying I'm not saying it's that. True. But I, I mean, we only got you know. I'll just use this one minute. But I mean, they would starve you out, and it's not just us. What I'm saying is, I mean, black activism as a whole mm -hmm. when that when during the bernie ca um, uh, campaign and stuff mm -hmm. when 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 all of that 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 private money was being released to, to to shore up the progressive movement and everything 
Black people got the least of that. No, please. All of that stuff went to 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 everybody. Everybody else. but us. Right. We got the least of that, but yet we were supposed to keep up with everybody mm-hmm. else. So mm-hmm. what we're saying is, progressive. We bring you this information so you understand that we can't. We if, if things aren't equal, then you can't expect us to do the same work. That I mean, you can't. You can't expect us to try to do this work. And you know we got our legs chopped off. Right. You know what I mean? Or, you know, we, so, so what I'm saying is, is the fact that this is just a microcosm of how progressives, the progressive movement, is funded in the whole. Mm-hmm. Black people, there's a pie, and we get one slice. Everybody else get the rest. And a slice, we get a tip. Right. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's enough talking out of me. Yep. And uh, look, and and just to close out the night, you cannot expect me to be excited about your candidates when they and you don't even care that our legs have been chopped out from under us. That that's not an issue for you. And and you think that Oh that, Dad, oh I'm sorry. Dad said that he enjoyed it. He said he really enjoyed our show. Hey Dad, thank you, Pop. Yep. Thanks so much. Yeah, but I mean you, you can't expect us to be excited about your candidates when you nor your candidates are concerned that our legs are chopped out from under us. The solution that your candidate has is to give everybody a jacket. But my problem is not that, not just that I don't have a jacket. My problem is also that I don't have any legs. And you're telling me that the jacket is going to make everything better for me. But ignore the fact that I have no legs. And I'm supposed to be excited about a candidate that ignores problems that are specific to me. No, we literally can't afford that. So thank you all for hanging in with us, uh, with this show. All of the links to all of this information will be available on this video tomorrow because it's 11 o'clock and we need to go to bed. So (laughs) I'm not even going to pretend to tell you I'm going to stay up and put all these links on here. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Black Lion. But continue to share this too. Share the video. But continue to share the video. Yeah, it's long. Yes, sometimes these videos are long. But look, that's what replay is for. Watch yeah, but, them in pieces. But, yeah, but so, and, but so is our oppression in this country. Uh, look, <laughs> <laughs> look. On that note, y'all, listen. Follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, like us on Facebook. Uh, consider support being a monthly supporter of us through Patreon. One-time donation, donation through PayPal or. Uh, what's that other thing? Go fund me. Uh, and as always, be really good to each other and peace and good night. <laughs> <laughs>